Hello, and welcome to the webinar, Future Driven Tax Strategies for the Evolving Environmental, Social, and Governance Landscape. My name is Eric Wallace with Argyle, and it's great to have everyone joining us today. I have a few administrative details to share with you, and then we'll dig into our discussion. First, we'd like to thank Vertex and KPMG for their partnership with today's event. They've been wonderful thought leadership partners to Argyle and are committed to providing you with valuable content and a great overall experience. Thank you again to Vertex and KPMG. We appreciate your joining us today. We welcome you to stay connected during today's event. For those of you who are active tweeters, please follow us on Twitter at Argyle Exec Forum. I also wanted to take a minute and touch on our content neutrality policy, which we've curated based on the feedback we've received over the years from our members. Argyle is very proud and protective of this policy as it reflects our commitment to ensure the neutrality and overall value of the content presented at our events. We've worked closely with our speaking faculty to ensure that you receive a set of balanced and neutral viewpoints during the session today, and we appreciate our members' support of this policy. For those of you who are seeking CPE credit today, you must answer at least three polling questions and remain on the session for its duration. Polls can be found under the Polls tab on the right-hand side of your console, right next to Q&A. Afterwards, if you are eligible to receive credit, you'll receive an email with a link to your certificates. If you have any questions about credits, please email cpe at argyleforum.com. Finally, and most importantly, please submit all questions that come up during today's event into the chat section of the interface. Following the panel discussion, we've set aside time for our speakers to weigh in on these questions. Before we start our discussion, I'd like to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves. Mike, can you start us, please? Sure, and thanks, Eric. Uh, my name is Mike Bernard, and I am the VP of uh, Tax Content and the Chief Tax Officer here at Vertex. I've been here about three and a half years. Uh, my role is basically uh, two things. One is I work with uh, a large group here at Vertex to bring the rates and rules of our global transaction tax engine to all of you. So um, work with a lot of our really good um, uh, employees around that. And then also do a lot of thought leadership as well around speaking and trying to develop the next series of software and services for our customers. Uh, prior to that, I was with Microsoft for almost 28 years and was their U.S. Uh, tax counsel and a general manager and essentially ran the North American operations for uh, Microsoft. And then Mark, I guess if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hey, good morning. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Mark Rems. I'm the practice leader for our TTS group, Transaction Tax Services. Uh, KPMG based in our, our Philadelphia office. I have over 20 years of experience helping companies implement systems, reporting tools, data analytics tools to calculate and remit uh, indirect taxes. And, and really going to focus on today, how does that, uh, how's that woven into the ESG um, discussion and, and what are companies doing? What are the requirements around uh, both uh, direct and indirect taxes? Great. And then Brett? Yes, hello everyone. Brett Weaver, I'm a partner at KPMG. I lead uh, KPMG Impact for our tax services. Uh, our KPMG Impact is really our moniker for both our solutions to clients around ESG, as well as our own internal focus on KPMG's ESG commitments. Okay, thank you. So it's good to be with both of you guys here today and uh, we've got a lot of material to cover. Um, one thing I think we understand as, as uh, speakers today is that the, there are people who know uh, a little bit about this topic. Some it may be your first introduction to it and some of you know more than others. So we're going to try and hit kind of a nice uh, thread through the middle of both educating you on what ESG is kind of really about, uh, where is the impetus of that coming from, and then really how does it kind of, so starting from the top of the funnel and moving down in into what impact it may have to, to tax departments. And so looking forward to our, our discussion today. Uh, there's the uh, notice of disclaimer. And then, so we're off and running now. And I think, uh, Brett, if you don't mind, um, take us through a little bit of uh, what the agenda looks like for today. 
Sounds great. Thanks, Mike. Uh, yeah, I think we'd like to start with really what we see currently in terms of ESG activities for business more generally. We've got some surveys and a few things here we think you'll find interesting. And then we'd like to jump into the overall ecosystem uh, for ESG initiatives. Uh, I think, uh, you know, many find this quite interesting and it, it really is the ecosystem that's driving a lot of the change that we're seeing here. Spend a little time on uh, those who are setting standards, describing what good looks like and rating agencies in the ESG space. And then we're seeing a lot of activity um, in the United States, but also around the world in terms of regulatory legislative action and ESG. We'll talk a bit about that. And then, of course, uh, you know, no presentation on tax related issues uh, would be complete without data and technology. And we'll spend some time on that as it relates to ESG. And then maybe um, where do we think this thing might be going uh, as, we, as we look out in the future? So with that, let's uh, let's jump into it. Uh, so. We'll start with, you know, ESG generally, I think you all know what ESG stands for, right? Environmental, social and governance. And we've highlighted a couple of uh, items within each of these um, you know, pillars of ESG that I think highlight what really this is all about. Um, but at the highest level, right, as, as we think about it, it, the environmental leg of ESG is really looking at how corporations uh, treat uh, our planet, right? Treat uh, the environment in which we live. And so we're focused on um, greenhouse gas emissions, right? Carbon capture, um, you know, water, waste, pollution, that type of thing. And many companies are making commitments about the, uh, the gains that they're making in this area. As we look at the social side, this is really just about how we treat other humans, right? Uh, whether it's, uh, you know, health and safety in the workforce, whether it's uh, working conditions around, um, you know, child labor and, you know, slave labor and that type of thing. Um, you know, it's it's really kind of covering the entire gambit, even things such as data protection around, uh, you know, consumers and other parties for which companies may have their data, um, you know, human rights and talent management, et cetera. So this is that broad impact of how we treat, um, you know, other human beings. And then, of course, uh, the governance side is really all about, you know, this is great that companies are doing more in these two areas of environment and social, um, but really how do companies ensure that they uh, actually walk the talk, right? So if, if these are areas we're making strides, what governance and procedures are in close, in, in basically in place to ensure that companies are actually moving forward and making real commitments in this space? So, you know, Mark, I, I know you, you've, you're seeing a lot of this uh, with with the clients that you're working with. I don't know if you have just a general perspective at a high level on this as well. Might be on mute, Mark. I think. Yes, I was. Thank you. Sure. Um, so there's a, a bottom line aspect to this as well, right? And you you look at companies that have struggled. Um, all of us, you know, retaining, um, attracting talent in the market um, with, with COVID-19 and, and some of the other business challenges that there are studies out there that there's a, absolutely a direct correlation between attracting the talent, retaining the talent um, with, with scores in ESG. So companies that are focusing on these specific items, right, are, are bringing the best and, and the brightest to their organizations and, and keeping them within their organization, which obviously impacts the, the bottom line. And I think you really see that with the younger generation, all these concepts that, that Brett talked about, the millennials, the Gen Z, um, you know, it's a, it's a top of mind item. And, and those, those folks are obviously critical uh, members of the workforce and, and the young leaders of our corporations. So um, this is going to become more and more important, and, and we really see it. I mean, that's one of the advantages of working for a firm like KPMG is we're talking to a lot of clients. We're, we're remotely now at a lot of different places, but um, you, you do see this a lot, um, and this topic is coming up a lot, and it doesn't matter whether we're talking about tax, IT, audit, um, people are, are, are discussing these ESG topics and how it relates to them and how it relates to their company. Okay, really good. Thanks, thanks, and I Mark. think the other thing too is just to, to note this is uh, for both Brett and Mark, I think you know this, this is, while there is some regulatory aspect around this about um, where you've seen the meeting in Glasgow and the Paris Accords and all these things kind of going on, uh, one of the more significant events was, was the business roundtable, which actually signed on for about 181 companies. And, and they actually put out a letter two years ago, which essentially said, hey, look, corporations uh, exist more than just for profits. So it's something beyond profits. And you've talked about that, particularly the, 
the E and the S, the, the governance piece of it, I think has always been there and will continue to be there. And I think a lot of the folks on the, the webcast here are familiar with that, but it's these other aspects of it that go beyond the profits. So uh, ethical behavior, a lot of things like that. So if you want to see what some of the work is being done, if you go to the business Roundtable website, which is a really powerful organization that only CEOs from um, companies can belong to, they've, they've got some principles there that they've also stated. So a good source if, if you want to go beyond these slides. Um, Makes sense. Saying? Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Uh, you know, I, I think this slide here hopefully uh, supports really what you know, Mark and Mike were just saying. This is a recent survey that KPMG did with um, CEOs. And, you know, essentially, as you look at the answers to these questions, uh, ESG is front and center at the top of the house, uh, CEOs as well as the board level. Uh, it, you know, the continued focus on um, really the environmental side. I, I think it's without question, the environmental side is really the, the big initiative right now amongst, uh, you know, global corporates. Uh, and I think this slide indicates that a lot of companies have made progress in this area. They want to keep the pedal to the metal, so to speak. But the other thing I think this slide shows is that, uh, you know, CEOs are turning to the social aspect of this. And I think that's happening now where we're seeing much more of a focus, again, not letting off on, on the gains around environmental side, but much more of a shift toward the social aspect is equally important in companies putting investments and resources into all the elements we just talked about on the social side. So uh, why don't we go to uh, one, one more slide here that I think is interesting. Uh, this is a survey that we did focused on uh, the tech sector. And so you know, that, that's notable, but we think some of the um, initiatives that we're seeing here are probably more widely applicable beyond just the tech sector. And so as we look at this you know, first question here, right, uh, really a company's approach around claiming tax benefits, right, almost half of respondents now indicate that they will only take a tax position if it both complies with the letter of the law and also the spirit of the law. And that's been a rapid change from where we were just a couple of years ago, really, on that survey question. In fact, if you look at the bottom of this, right, only one in five companies now take the, the view that they will take any tax position for which they're legally entitled to take it. Right. And, and I think that's really a change that we're seeing there. Um, the next question, right, the tax uh, department's level of involvement in ESG initiatives. Uh, you know, having some involvement, you know, almost 50 percent, right, slightly below. Uh, versus only a quarter of companies having, you know, relatively little involvement. So we're seeing that ratchet up as well. And then the, the, the donut chart on the right here, right, I think is also interesting, you know, where, it's, you know, three quarters of companies in the tech sector anyway, um, and, and this is C-suite executives. This is not getting the opinion of the head of tax, right, but C-suite executives are of the view, right, that they, they feel they're receiving public pressure right, to do more public reporting around their global tax contributions and payments. Yeah, and just a couple comments there, but I think one thing that we've seen particularly with our customers is that getting things right is that it's really kind of a back to the basics kind of uh, mentality. Whereas before, I think what you've, you've seen is you've seen this idea of the globalization of tax rates where you've seen things kind of leveled it out. It started with the Trump tax cuts uh, back in 2017 and have kind of continued with this idea that Secretary Yellen has promoted is this global minimum tax. And so what I think we're seeing more than anything today is that tax departments, which historically their only public facing disclosure was on their 10 Qs or their 10 Ks. I think they also have to have a good story about why they're receiving certain benefits in certain geographies. Uh, how they're uh, how they're actually doing business, what benefits do they receive, and is that tied to significant employment levels and significant economic impact in certain geographies? So, with all of that and everything that went on uh, with the OECD over the last several years, more and more companies have to really kind of have a public story. Tax departments do around their global footprint and what they're doing. So, yeah, and I I think uh, kind of a core foundation here, right, is is limiting risk, whether that's reputational risk, you know, loss of of market share. Um, I think this is a pretty big stat here that you know historically, if there was a a tax, you know, uh, initiative that could save the company money, it was it was automatic, as obviously as long as it was to the letter of the law. 
Um, but there is now a business decision you have to make on what's the reputation. If this gets out that you're pulling, you know, $3 million from a, a jurisdiction that was intended to go to the schools, right? Is that really worth um, the negative publicity? So, you know, and, and there have been studies that say companies that have formal ESG processes, such as sending out questionnaires, you know, committees, doing workshops, right? there's clear improvement in mitigating risk and identifying additional business opportunities. And it's because you're just having more collaboration about these items. So I think it's a major thing that ESG also helps companies avoid some of the big business risks that come with some, you know, some of the things that we talked about. Yeah. yeah good insight. So thank you. Well, let's move on to what's driving all these changes then. And uh, it really is the ESG ecosystem. And so, you know, we tried to capture the ecosystem on one slide here to give you a sense for it. Um, it, it so it really is a combination of these things and they affect different companies and even different industries differently. You know, some of these uh, members of the ecosystem will be driving change very significantly in some industries and less so in others. As so we kind of work across this, this chart, right, we start with um, our framework or standard setters, right? So you look at the bottom here, that could be the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, for example, or G GRI, Global Reporting uh, Information, right? So the, these are examples of companies out there that are setting standards in the ESG space. So that's, um, you know, really how do you measure your greenhouse gases. And if you're making process, uh, you, know, cha you know, changes, if you are moving toward, uh, you know, net zero carbon emissions, how do you measure that, right? How do you report it, et cetera, right? So that's what the, really the framework setters, right? Their job is all about really defining what good looks like. As we move across this you know, spectrum, we've listed you know, other companies here, right? And certainly peer companies uh, within the same industry are often driving change, right? No one wants to be at the back end of the pack. Maybe some might argue they don't want to be on the front end either, but comfortably in the middle. And so clearly, you know, peers are driving change here as well. Um, as we move across here, you know, the rating agencies are, are, are pretty, uh, you know, significant for some companies, for some industries, particularly if you have institutional investors uh, that have large blocks and are very interested in ESG, they are definitely driving change. And they oftentimes will look to, you know, some of the um, you know, rating agencies, et cetera, in terms of their measurement, right? So we have the standard setters saying what good looks like. We have the rating agencies then essentially providing a grade right for you know each company how well are you doing against those standards and i might add the standards are kind of the wild west at this point right everybody who's in the standards game has their own view of what good looks like and it's not the same it's kind of a mess we'll talk about this later on in terms of regulatory requirements that may be trying to make some sense out of all these different standards but the rating agencies will you know will focus on uh, each of these pillars e s and g and provide a rating and then an overall rating and that that's pretty important to many companies and to you know, a lot of external stakeholders. We've already mentioned regulators and legislators. Uh, we're seeing more and more of that uh, you know, weigh in. We're gonna talk about that later on in the presentation. And then, you know, uh, Mike already mentioned the business roundtable, right? As we looked at this uh, second to last column here, and these types of trade associations and groups that are leading in, often led by CEOs uh, and chairmen of the board, et cetera, um, are driving some significant change and in, in, in many instances, revolutionary ideas of the purpose of the corporation, as Mike mentioned. And then of course, end users, which could be anything from investors to customers, um, you know, to uh, NGOs, et cetera, in different industries and different companies, they are weighing in heavily and have a pretty significant impact as well. Okay. And um, before we move on, um, I know Mark, you maybe had some comments on this slide as well, but uh, in your chat feature, um, this was the first of our polling questions. So if you're interested in continuing education credits today, uh, we asked, um, we asked a, just a really simple question, how important are ESG initiatives to your company? So it looks like a lot of you have populated and voted. So please do that. We'll keep it open here for a little bit more. But I guess um, maybe, maybe to you, Mark, I might ask you just a quick question. As you see the polling results come in, um, it looks like almost... 70% either are saying very or moderately uh, important to them. I don't know what you're seeing in your practice or Bert, what you're seeing. Uh, any surprises here? Or any any thoughts you can take away from, from this polling? 
Yeah, from my perspective, it's you know very much focused on you know employee retention, uh, acquisition, and also you know minimizing risk, but also you know those core fundamentals you know around social governance environment, just getting so integrated into you know the success of the company. I mean, everything right now in in our firm is about hiring the the right, the best keeping the best and and if this is top of mind for those individuals it it's has to be a part of our organization um, so from an employee standpoint standpoint that's important and then from a risk standpoint you know we talked about it negative publicity um, loss of market share right that competitors might be focusing on this and if you're not right. um, that could that could bring a customer um, take a customer away from you and, and move it to your competitor so um, these are critical aspects um, to an organization and and I would say what I'm seeing kind of aligns with this, right? That it's either very or, or moderately a part of the culture of an organization. And, and you know, as the younger generation comes in, it's going to be more and more prevalent. Hey, I think you're right. And, and what we've seen too is, is that um, the more public your company is, the more you're concerned about your brand. Uh, and it also depends too, I think, Mark, what you've also seen too is it depends what industry you're in, right? So to the extent that you're in... Um, you know, some industries that, that affect the environment um, much greater, you have to be more aware of these things, correct? Yeah, and, and I think the, the no-brainers, right, when, when you say what industries are impacted by ESG, it's oil and gas, metals and mining, power generation, you know, those j jump at you right off the bat because the, the, the product that is being sold directly impacts the environment and there's alternatives for energy now. Um, so obviously those are very important ones and, and those are what people generally think of. But I think another big one that we see, and it, it kind of goes to the next slide, um, is consumer products, right? At the, the end of the day, you know, a big driver for this is going to be the end consumer and, and, you know, what purchasing behavior they have. So companies are tailoring their marketing, their branding um, to, to these ESG initiatives, right? So just throwing out some of the stats here, um, you know, customers looking to support ESG initiatives, you know, 96% of the companies feel that they have some pressure. Um, and what's very interesting is this middle stat here, right? That, well, are you willing to, are, are customers actually willing to put their money where their mouth is, right? Um, so 80% of North Americans want to know the origin of the products they buy, right? So it is impacting purchasing behavior. 69% um, of environmentally conscious buyers are willing to pay a premium for recycled products. Um, so I, I think really it, it's these can impact the buying decisions, which obviously impact um, the bottom line. And, and we look at co consumer uh, products, there's enough, a number of angles, right? One is the packaging, right? So are they right. using recycled materials? Um, is there a lot of plastic? You know, what is is it overly... Uh, produced from a packaging standpoint. There's also the concept of localism, right? You know, companies want to shorten the supply chain, right? We don't want to use fossil fuels to deliver these products. And also, you know, something that happened with COVID-19 with localism is, are the products equally available to all groups, right? We see that with the, the COVID-19 vaccine is, is one of the, the obvious examples. But, you know, is the product even available um, to, to end users like internet services, uh, mobile voice. Um, so that's another concept that, that companies are dealing with to make sure that you know, all buyers have equal access uh, to these products. And then you know, when you think about it, companies also have the decision around e-commerce, right? That e-commerce now takes you know, 3,000 store shipping points and it you know, exponentially it increases it to everyone's doorstep, right? Well, that means that trucks have to go there. Um, there's gasoline, right? We know that some companies are, are looking into alternative energy for fueling these trucks, but, you know, there is a direct impact on the environment by having to ship to every single house <laughs> in the world. So yes, e-commerce does expand revenue, expand sales, but what's the cost on ESG for that? Yep. Very good. Some really good comments there. Thanks, Mark. Um, so, uh, looks like the poll, we had a number of people, uh, add on to the poll. So thank you for voting and appreciate that. Um, Brett, uh, I know you've got some comments around the reporting standards, if you would. 
<clears throat> yeah, you know, uh, we're really, you know, going through a walkthrough here, really, of some of the major drivers in the ESG ecosystem, right? So we're talking about the impact the consumers have. It's really the discussion we had the last few minutes. Um, but let's do talk a little bit about the, um, you know, the standard setters. So GRI, as I mentioned, is probably one of the more prominent ones. And here we've highlighted, uh, since this is a, you know, tax focused discussion, you know, what it does good look like in the tax area? around ESG. And you can see here that, uh, you know, that this is the headings of the chapters, right? You'd find it in 207 of the GRI standards. And here under dash one, right, the, there's an expectation that companies would publish a global tax strategy document or a global tax policy. And that would describe really what they believe in, right? Here, here's who we are as a company. Here's how we uh, manage our approach to tax. Here's the positions we will and will not take, et cetera. And you can see here in dash two, right? There's an expectation that you would describe the governance around tax that you have in place and your, uh, your tax risk management control framework that uh, not only identifies the level of risk that a company is willing to take, but how you ensure that um, your decisions really adhere to what you believe in. Uh, dash three here um, is about, um, you know, engagement with stakeholders and really what these standard setters would like to see companies do is have a program in place that allows them to reach out to all of the members of the ecosystem that we just talked about and essentially ask them, how am I doing on tax? Right. I mean, what would you like to see? Right. So, again, a lot of these standard setters, you know, I work with companies every day that say, you know, that that's garbage. I'm not going to do it. Right. But uh, it's interesting to know what standard setters are looking for. And the latest one that they've added effective just for this year is dash four, where if you are a company that wishes to say that your overall GRI compliance, so that's environmental, social governance, the whole thing, you now would then be required to do voluntary country by country tax reporting. So that's the new one that they added here. So. You know, again, a different standard setter would have a slightly different view of what good looks like, but this gives you a sense of at least what one looks like. Okay. Very good. Thanks, Brett. Um, so, well, go ahead, Mike. Well, I guess I guess just on this slide, um, what we tried to do here was we tried to post up with some, particularly looking at the left-hand side of this slide, uh, of publicly available information around taxes. And um, as I mentioned earlier, um, there's kind of this this flattening of the earth, if you is if you will, around corporate income taxes, but then ESG comes into into play here, and you can read down and read the things about transfer pricing, uh, how you impact locals uh, with uh, your employment. But I guess there's there's two comments I kind of want to make here. First of all, uh, I think a number of you are familiar with what's called the co uh, corporate social responsibility report, or they call them CSRs. 90% uh, of the Fortune 500 actually put out a CSR. And these reports go from anywhere from, say, 20 to 50 pages to over 100 pages. And essentially, they touch on four areas. They touch on the environment, they touch on ethics, they touch on economics, and they touch, and they touch on the philanthropy of a, of a company. And so it's really kind of this, again, this idea that the corporation exists beyond profits. And here's how we impact uh, the people around us, our suppliers, the people we hire, the people, you know, uh, and, and our consumers. And so one of the things that I would say to you is I would I would encourage anybody on the webcast today to go look at maybe a CSR report. Uh, your company probably puts one out. Um, and if they don't, then just go look at some of some of the companies, uh, particularly in the high tech sector. Those tend to be rather uh, detailed and, um, and quite well written. But I think what you're gonna, what you might see in the future is beyond the footnotes in the 10Q and the 10K, is you're gonna maybe there could be a time soon where tax departments are gonna be asked to contribute to that CSR. And presently, you don't really see anything in there at this point. But again, this goes to the public-facing story that you have around your tax uh, footprint uh, within your company. Again, fair share. Do you have proper transfer pricing? Um, are you doing the right remittance on transaction taxes? So a lot of those things are, are what we're kind of starting to see in, in a bunch of companies. I don't know if Brad or Mark, you have anything else there or we can move on. Yeah, I, th I think the theme of paying your fair share, you're gonna see that, that more in this presentation, yeah. but it also, when you talk about the global economy, right? Businesses are doing businesses cross border and their transfer pricing, income tax, indirect tax implications. For example, you know, a lot of companies that we work with are US-based. 
selling electronic services globally while you're selling into these countries and you're currently not registered in those jurisdictions, should you be collecting you know, VAT and GST? Right. You're, you're making money off these citizens, but you're not collecting and remitting taxes. Um, and, and some countries like Norway and South Africa have passed legislation that foreign sellers um, are, are required to register and, and pay VAT and GST. So I think when you start looking at those cross-border transactions, um, this is a big play and more and more countries are going to pass legislation for foreign-based sellers. More and more countries are going to ask for real-time reporting, uh, digital compliance. Um, that, that's going to be a major driver. Yeah, for, for sure. Yeah, yeah the things, uh, you know, I would add to that, Mike, is, uh, you, you know, you kind of walk through the, the big picture of, um, you know, where companies are focused on reporting, et cetera. And I think if we double click down in terms of what role does tax play into that, right, as we look at the rating agencies, you know, it, it is that reporting prong. You, you can see here, you know, S&P Global looks at three things, right, that tax reporting's in the middle there. And I, I do think it's, it, it's interesting. They, they care a lot about the fact that companies are following through on their tax compliance. And that's across all aspects right. of income tax and indirect tax. But I also think it's important to note that the tax policy that they're looking for and, and the tax reporting that's important to a lot of the standard setters is only income tax, right? right. So like the country by country reporting, that they really only want to hear about income tax, right? And and so what we're seeing is a lot of companies that that are moving that direction of doing you know tax payment reporting, even though the standard setters are really interested in income tax. Many companies believe that that's only half the narrative, right? And that if they are if they're going to move that direction, we'll talk more later on about you know why and that that may happen, but. Uh, many companies are supplementing that that uh, what the standard setters are asking for with information around transactional taxes, et cetera, and maybe even many instances, you know, global, you know, contributions that just the footprint of the company is pushing, you know, tax collections, et cetera. So, so I think that's important to just understand what what the rating agencies and the standard setters are looking for versus maybe what some other companies are doing. And this other box here, right, the effective tax rate, again, that's a focus on, you know, a, a company's effective income tax rate, right, and whether it's right. essentially too low, right? So, so anyway, I think it's important. You can look here in the policy, you can kind of see some of the things they're looking for. If, if you were to publish good policy, if you haven't already published one, these are the types of issues they would want to see you address in, in that policy. I think it's also important to know that we don't want to overblow the tax thing, right? Because I, I think it'll it'll evolve over time. But, you know, but, but tax right now, as you look at an overall ESG rating, since we're talking about rating agencies here, tax only accounts for anywhere from like two to 5% of your overall score, right? And so I think as our poll shows, right? Some companies like, you know, you know, maybe I'm not all that interested in ESG and even if I am, tax is not a huge driver. Um, for other companies, it, it is, even though the rating agencies may not put a lot of weight on it um, if from a reputational standpoint and maybe in connection with some of the commitments company has made, um, their tax ESG rating really does matter. But anyway, I thought that context might be helpful to the audience. Oh, I think it is. Uh, and we appreciate that. Thanks, Brad. Um, so with that, I, you know, there's a lot of things going on on the federal level. Uh, obviously there's, we'll make some comments of what's going on on the state level, but I think, um, I think Brad, if you want to uh, take us through some of these thoughts, appreciate that. Yeah, sounds good, Mike. Uh, you know, we, we know that the current administration is very much focused on uh, clean energy transition, not only um, globally, but certainly here in this country where they have more uh, control and opportunity to drive those initiatives. Um, that all started, as we know, uh, immediately after the uh, Biden administration came uh, into play with uh, rejoining the Paris Climate Agreement. That has driven a lot of um, initiatives with uh, U.S.-based multinationals. And I think that was evidenced in our CEO poll that we had at the very beginning of this. 
Um, but additional efforts, right, uh, around the environment, including this environmental justice executive order issued early on in the Biden administration, right, that really focuses on adding significantly more staff, um, you know, to various agencies, including, uh, you know, some of the newer agencies, such as the Office of Environmental Justice, right? And so we're, we're seeing a lot of effort from the administration in this clean energy transition with clearly a DE&I, right, uh, lens around what they're doing. Uh, of course, a number of legislative proposals, right? A lot of that focused on trying to get to a, a net zero in the, in the electrical grid, right? Um, providing incentives for more of a transition to clean energy, including, uh, you know, electricity, um, extending green credits. And, and in many instances, and you kind of have to be deep into this, we'll bore you with it, right? But um, making a lot of these green energy credits direct pay credits, right? It, it, up to this point in time, all these credits for a green energy facility, um, you know, only offset your tax liability. Well, many of these developers don't have tax liability, so they actually have to shift the tax benefits to equity funders. That whole game would change if the administration is able to move forward on this and actually change those tax credits to be direct pay. Um, obviously, a lot of discussion around fair share of tax. We see that in a lot of uh, the proposals that are coming out. And Mike already mentioned, you know, the successful political agreement at the G20 level to now have a minimum tax globally that would apply to all companies. Um, the last thing I'll cover here quickly and then turn over to my panelists for their observations, right, is uh, in the disclosure front, there's a lot of action happening there as well. Uh, many of you are probably following that, right, with the SEC and with the uh, CFTC as well and the Federal Reserve, all focused on climate-related disclosures um, and launching a lot of commitments here as well as staffing up and all these agencies to be focused on um, really uh, ESG matters. The, the SEC at, at the very beginning of the Biden administration formed an ESG um, fraud task force and uh, you know, Mike seeing a bit of that, I'll let him speak to that, but I think that's something to watch. I will say that there has never been a task force formed at the SEC in its history that has not um, issued significant investigations, fines and penalties. So anyway, we'll let Mike talk more about that. But uh, around country by country tax reporting, uh, you know, big surprise even to me is to see that the House actually finally passed a bill that had been kicking around there forever that would actually require country by country tax reporting. Um, it'll probably never get by the Senate, but I think it's interesting to see it actually got through the House. So Mike, I know you have some thoughts on this as well. Uh, I do. And um, I might first just take the, um, we've got a couple questions that came in from the uh, chat. One is about greenwashing. I think, are we going to get into that later, Brad, or is that something you wanted to do? No, I think um, this is a good spot here because that's what the ESG's task force is focused on. So, um, so I'd say go ahead and take that. I, I think some people are just wondering what what is that? What is greenwashing? So okay. Yeah, you know, great great question, right? Uh, essentially, greenwashing is a pejorative term, right? It's uh, the companies are out there really saying, hey, look how great I am in, in the uh, environmental space and even the social space. It captures both, even though it seemed like it, it applies to environment. Um, but in reality, uh, it's smoke and mirrors that they're really not, uh, you know, the, the clean global citizen that they might be claiming. So that's greenwashing. Um, and, and that, you know, that, that can be done by, you know, in, well, I guess one of the risks with that and why this is happening is there is no one standard out there um, in terms of, you know, really what is, what does it look like to make commitments and to make progress uh, from an environmental standpoint? Um, and there's no set framework for reporting. So that's one of the things the SEC is focused on. They plan to give us rules around what good looks like and what must be re uh, mandatorily reported um, sometime around the first part of the year. There's an open public consultation now for that. But this fraud task force, which exists today, is focused specifically on greenwashing. And that issue is largely around companies that are, are, make, are telling everyone in an ESG report which is not audited in many cases. Here's all the things we're doing. Here's our numbers we're doing so well. And in fact, it's not true, right? It's focused on that. It's also focused on if you're making all these claims in an ESG report and, and they're so significant to the strategic direction of your company, and it's in that same discussion is completely omitted in your 10K or your Q, there seems to be a disconnect there. It seems like it's very significant and relevant information that should be disclosed to uh, investors. And if it's in the 10K, 
completely different game in terms of attestation and assurance. And why is it missing? These are the types of issues that the fraud task force is focused on in the ESG space. And it's all about greenwashing. It is. And, and I think what if I would point you to uh, another source to if you go to sec.gov, there's a um, there's actually a sample question that actually is now going out from the SEC to companies um, for their 10 Qs. And, and essentially what this question is, it has like nine questions with a, with a number of those questions, they have subparts to them. And essentially what, what the SEC is doing is, if you think back when I talked mm -hmm. about the CSR, the Corporate Social Responsibility Report, they're looking at those reports and then they're looking at seeing what you disclosed actually in the 10 Q or the K. And if those things, if the disclosures aren't, if there's much more disclosed in the CSR versus a 10Q, as, as Brent was kind of mentioned there, they want to know why that is. And so, but most of those questions focus around quantit uh, uh, qu quantitatively saying what you're doing. So you can you can use language in a qualitative aspect, but they want to know the numbers, like how are you remediating things? Um, you know, what, how much water are you using in a certain area? Are, are you you know being responsible around how much electricity? Or if you're if you're burning more coal, why are you doing that? If you've remediated that, how much have you saved? So a lot of it is based around the numbers. So you really got to get some. Um, so you really got really got to get some your arms around a lot of those things. Uh, that's that's what they're really kind of looking at. I, I want to take one other question here from the chat, and then maybe Mark, I know you've got some some thoughts around this as well. Um, we had a question coming in. It says, "What does the spirit of the tax law mean?" Are there any initiatives to require responsible handling by government? Um, and I, I don't know if Mark or Brett, if, if you want to take that one on, maybe that was the comment you made, back, Brett, about the letter of law and the spirit of the law. So mm -hmm. I'll leave it to you. Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll dive in first, Mark. You may have some thoughts on that as well. Um, right. It, uh, I, I think probably one of the best ways to see that is uh, really look globally and, and also in this country at the pandemic, right? We had government action that was providing a lot of pandemic relief from Payroll Protection Act and, you know, and, and other things, right? Um, there were a number of companies that legally qualified for those incentives that passed on taking them. And, and I think that in part it was because you know, even though they legally qualified and, you know, the, the spirit of the law in some companies view was really to provide um, um, aid and to prop up companies that were suffering financially. Many of these companies that legally qualified were not suffering. They were doing very well during the pandemic. And I think that's a good example that even though we legally qualify for this, it doesn't seem consistent with the spirit behind why that rule was enacted. And so we are not going to claim that benefit. So I, that's really what they're after. Yeah, and I, I think a simple way to put it is if it was publicized in the news about you doing this, how would you feel about it, right? Do you start to say, ah, I wish we hadn't done that? Then I would question whether it was spirit of the law. Um, so that it, it's a way to look at it that if this became public and you went this route, um, do you feel comfortable in that position? Um, we did have another question come in on the chat, uh, and it's uh, obviously uh, this, this is a, we get this question too uh, at our company sometimes. Is are there key ESG initiatives uh, focused on listed companies for now? Are are they just focused on them? Because I know we've been talking about SEC disclosures and reporting. Are there new requirements expected for private companies in the near term? Um, so I don't know if if Mark or Brett, if you want to take that on. Um, I mean, I guess the overall comment is ESG is is really kind of company internally focused uh, for a lot of for a lot of reasons right now. But but if if uh, if you want to take that on, it, it uh, appreciate either. Yeah, one Mike, I think you hit that. it right. It's uh, you know it it goes back to the ESG ecosystem we mentioned, right? If if it's top down company and management, you know the board believes these are the right things to do, and usually not everything that's on the list to do here from the standard setters, but some areas they think are important they want to focus on, and lean into it. Those companies are moving that direction, whether they're public or private, right? But um, 
you know, not, not all companies, as our survey results showed, right? A full one third yeah. of companies are like, yeah, it's not important to us, ESG, right? We just saw that in the survey results. Or I don't know anything about it, which would, to me, indicate it's not that important or you'd know about it, right? So, yeah, it's a <laughs> one or two companies. This is not a big deal for them. Right. And, um, and and that's the reason why the the SEC and we're seeing the same thing in Europe are, are, are you know, they believe that it's important to investors to know what that stance is. You know, if you're not investing in sustainability, you know, whatever that means to you, right, in terms of ESG, that's important to investors and you need to tell them that. Now, the SEC obviously only has the ability to push that forward with public companies. Right. But uh, and so when they do issue their rules and they will. And they will be focused on environment. They'll be focused on board diversity primarily. They they will not focus on tax, at least not in this initial stage. Uh, but you know, hold on, we'll see where that goes, right? But uh, I, I, that's that's the landscape. Some you know companies will do it of their own volition, but for public companies, they're going to have requirements. Okay. Um, then we'll move forward. Um, All right. So yeah, let me just jump in. There's a couple of points in my panel, so I'm sure we want to weigh in just on the federal side. You know, th this is the um, this goes back to um, October's version of that of the you know the House bill, and it keeps changing. So we'll see where it goes. But we just want to call out a couple of things that I think are, are really first time that we're seeing these types of things, right? Um, one that the you know the the Democrats who are really supporting and writing the bill, right, are, are putting in a lot more green energy credits. And, and that's consistent with the overall direction of the administration. Um, so we're expanding these credits. And as you can see, some of these credits, we're bringing them back with the production tax credit for wind and solar, right? But interestingly here, for the first time, we're seeing that the base credit, which really isn't that great, right, is significantly different than a bonus credit. And um, and then even if you get a bonus credit, you can increase that by a certain increase here, which is largely driven by all these uh, you know ESG initiatives we've talked about. So if you start with a base, and how do you get to a bonus and then add an increase? It's really around these issues of prevailing wage, apprenticeship, and domestic content. And so in order to get to the bonus um, you know rate on these energy credits, right? You you would need to be able to build your project paying workers at a prevailing wage. Um, you would also need to involve in that workforce um, a certain level of apprentices who you're helping them develop the skills and abilities to, you know, to do well at that type of a, a job. And all of these things, as you can see kind of in this detail, um, you know, if you were to miss some of these things, so as it turns out from the Secretary of Labor decides you did not pay a prevailing wage, well, you could pay each of the workers that difference plus a fine of $5,000 per affected employee. And you can kind of see that's rippling out the same through the apprenticeship, et cetera. To get that bonus amount, right, the, the facility has to have domestic content in it, right? And you can kind of see a sense of that as well. If you wanted to get the direct pay credit rather than having it just offset tax, but this is money that the government's going to pay you directly, you also have to meet this domestic content. So I think this is a, kind of a first in many instances of not only providing some tax incentives, but then weaving in very clear ESG type initiatives around the social aspect that would drive the amount of that credit and how you get that credit. And I think that's actually fascinating to watch how that might develop. Okay. Um... We did have a couple more questions come in, so maybe uh, maybe we'll take those as well right here. Is um, uh, back a little bit. Uh, there was a question about do, do, does ESG apply to educational institutions? Uh, I think the answer is kind of the same as the private the private companies. It's, it just depends on how important it is to the educational institutions, and I, I would assume, particularly at the university level, there's a lot of the students care about that stuff. So. Yeah, it's huge in that space, right? And we're, we're working with a number of universities that, you know, frankly are very focused on, you know, their their, you know, environmental side of things, right? And making some pretty big investments in in power, you know, producing agreements, PPAs, right, to purchase clean energy to power the universities and things like that. And they're making uh, it very public with their student body and all the rest of it. So, uh, I mean, that's just an example, it, it, but it, it's a big deal in the educational arena. Okay. Uh, we also had another question that came in. Um, will there be a consolidation of reporting requirements, SASB, 
TCFD, GRL, we, you know, we covered obviously some of those. As having multiple standards, is time consuming versus spending more time acting on them? Thank you. Uh, I, it, it's the Wild West right now, right, Brett? I mean, it's kind of like that's, we, we don't have these standards quite yet. So. Yeah, it, it really is. And that that is definitely a perceived problem. No one's happy with that, right? From, from investors who are trying to consume this material to companies who are trying to figure out what to say. Uh, regulators are not happy with it either. My, my own view is that um, we will see a consolidation of these standards. Um, exactly how that happens will be yet to you know, be determined. One of the things the SEC has asked about in their public comment is whether they should be prescriptive on rules or whether they should you know, maybe make reference to some of the primary standard setters and indicate that that's you know, the preferred direction to go and you have to disclose which of the standards that you're using and adhere to them. So, but one way or another, I think we're definitely gonna see a consolidation because it, it, it is a concern and it's, it, it does cloud the efforts that companies are trying to make and the information that investors and others need. Um, just a couple things I've seen in the poll where for folks, we've, we've only asked one question yet. We've got two to go. So, and we have three total. So just hang with us. And I know we're, we're coming up to the top of the hour. So we do have two polling questions to go. Um, there is another question that came in. Um, how do these changes affect the USA versus its ability to compete in the rest of the world? So obviously it's important, I think, to a lot of Western democracies. How does that impact? I think probably the question more is by how to how is Asia responding to these things in, in that instance? So I, either Brad or Mark, you want to take that on? Yeah, I mean, I, I will say there are some studies done on on Asia PAC, and I think one of them was that seventy nine percent of investors increased their ESG investments in Asia PAC in response to COVID, and fifty percent of investors said they're either completely to a large extent consider ESG in their investment analysis and buying decisions. I think you haven't seen as much, you know, hardcore legislation or, or regulations come through. But I think from a consumer and end user standpoint, there is still the same, you know, urgency around ESG and and weaving that into um, their purchasing uh, behaviors. So I think the the ultimate answer to the question would be ideally all regions of the world would be focusing on this, and then it would be a net across the board. Um, and yes, there are specific taxes like uh, white good taxes and and um, other green fees that are charged in certain jurisdictions. But I think overall, the, the goal is to have a level playing field globally. Yep. Thanks, Mark. Um, okay. And um, so we're going to talk a little bit about here, or first of all, here's our poll question and then Mark will or walk us through the, through the next section. This is which ESG area do you see tax department having the most impact or being engaged. And I see a lot of people just, they're hitting the pole pretty hard right now. So that's good. So keep that going. So uh, with that, we'll keep the poll open and let's just for a few more, uh, maybe about 10 or 15 more seconds. And um, looks like governance. I don't think that is a surprise. I don't think that's a surprise to you. Would it be Mark that it looks like, I mean, that's kind of what, Tax has been doing for a long time, right? So yeah. Uh, well, I think that's at the end of the day. If if you don't follow the governance, you might get fired. If if you don't do something on the environmental <laughs> social, you know, it, it, it's not that hardcore mandate just yet. Um, but yeah, I I think what we're seeing is there's a heavy focus on investing in meeting governance, right? And you know, when my practice is more on the indirect tax side, the the real time reporting digital reporting around compliance, real-time reporting of taxes, that is just a huge initiative globally. And it seems like every two or three months, a new country is coming out with a real-time reporting requirement because jurisdictions, they want their money quicker. They want to be able to review an invoice, approve it before you send it to their customer. Um, and there's a lot of technology and data and process needs around that. So th this makes sense to me. And this is where kind of Vertex fits into it when we get into the data and technology discussion as well. How does that impact ESG? And I'd say first and foremost, it's back to that concept of, of paying the, the fair share of taxes. You could probably jump to the next slide if the poll is done. Yep. Um, 
you know, we, we see the different concepts here, the most critical items are around the E, the S, and the G. Um, but overall, right, it's companies need to pay their fair share, not being in the public that you didn't do something right. Um, and you pair that with the expanding complexities in calculation and, and compliance. Um, it's very top of mind for tax departments. So, you know, one thing off the bat, right, is we anticipate new green taxes coming out, right, depending on certain products. And th this already exists today. I mentioned, you know, white goods in South Carolina. Um, Canada has some fees on screen sizes, environmental fees, right? They, they exist today, but we're anticipating more and more of those and being able to categorize your products and assign which ones, you know, fit the, the ESG requirements to charge the new tax or fee. Um, there's, there's complexity around that. Um, reverse audits, right? We're doing a lot of Coupa, Ariba implementations on the procurement side. You might not think, well, how does tax impact that? Well, mm -hmm. validating that you're paying the right tax up front is pretty critical because if you're a big company and you're not validating tax, you might have a, um, a direct pay permit in a given jurisdiction, but you're letting a lot of cash go out the door. But then all of a sudden, every three years, you're going back to the state and saying, give me a check for $10 million. And they post on their website that you're trying to do this and it's diverting funds from fixing roads and fixing schools, right? That's not good publicity. So we recommend companies get it right up front. As long as you're calculating the right taxes, you're remitting the right taxes, you know, you want to stay under the radar. And, and this is where solutions like Vertex, you know, that's that's the goal of that system to integrate with your ERP and get it right the first time. So you're not having to go back to jurisdictions and go through the fight uh, to get this money back, which can lead to, to bad publicity. And then finally, you know, the reporting. You know, we've seen states almost go to real-time reporting, right? Jurisdictions want cash earlier to, to uh, invest in some of these ESG initiatives, better reporting about cross-border transactions. Um, and then ultimately, we, we do think there might be some ESG reporting requirements once there's some standardization. And I think it's going to be difficult, especially how do you compare companies in different industries with ESG parameters? How do you come up with a common score? But eventually, there is going to be, you know, some sort of formulaic uh, uh, formula for doing that a driver that that you can publish. And then in that case, you're going to need external auditors, you're going to need internal orders auditors to validate that, um, those reports that, that you're publishing out to, um, to your customers. Okay. Thanks, Mark. And I know at the company, one of the things that our customers have been asking for, and I'm sure you're running into it in your practice, Mark, is not only the imposition of the fees, but we're at, but more of our customers are asking for returns. So returns business that supports that, I think obviously that completes the end-to-end -end cycle of actually the compliance. So um, we've got an initiative at the company to work more and more on, on bringing those fees um, to the customers. That's right, because a lot of times it's different data elements that you need on the it report, is. like number of units, right, that might not show up in your standard report. So there's work not just to calculate it right, but to also uh, remit the taxes properly. Agreed, yeah. Um, and then we'll have, just so all of you, we've, this is our last substantive slide then, and then and then we'll have one last polling question right after this slide. So hang in there. So um, I don't know, uh, Brett or Mark, um, I think one of you were going to take this slide then. Yeah, I, and, and I think we were just going to do a final roundtable and kind yeah. of our individual thoughts, right, and and what's next for, for ESG. I mean, me personally, you know, working directly with companies to automate taxes, I see more of those ESG-related taxes coming, right? So having the agility, the flexibility to set these fees and taxes up in your system during purchasing and sales is, is going to be pretty critical. More reporting requirements, right? I think if we can get to a unified scoring system for ESG and then the ability to automate those reports and, and actually create those reports and then having those audited by external and internal order, auditors, and I do think there's going to be more coordination between jurisdictions, right? We've already seen uh, countries pass uh, legislation around foreign sellers. I, I think there's going to be more cooperation um, to enable companies to pay their fair share globally and not just in their home country. Right. Okay, thanks. Uh, Brad? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll add my two cents. Uh, you know, I definitely underscore Mark's point of more transparency. That's clearly the direction of travel 
and that'll bring up all the implications that Mark indicated. Uh, the the additional one I'll put on here, and we kind of highlight it in, the, in this uh, slide, right, is that tax is unique amongst all other areas of ESG, I think, in that it is both a measure of sustainability as well as a driver of sustainability. And, and that can make it really difficult, right? Because, you know, the, the view is if you're not paying enough tax, you're, you know, you're, you're not a, a good corporate citizen, right? But on the flip side, you have governments that are providing all kinds of incentives to corporates to undertake certain behavior, whether it's investing in low income housing credits, right? Or to purchase clean energy that will reduce your tax bill. Right. And, uh, and and that's been a big disconnect. Rating agencies don't really get that. And they will penalize companies for actually doing the right thing, so to speak. Right? I think that, uh, you know, government, as we set standards, et cetera, have a responsibility to help call out that dichotomy and really develop some rules that companies are rewarded. Right. Rather than penalized for doing the right thing. And so I think that's something to watch. And just a reminder to get your polling answer in to make sure you get your CP credit. I think we still yep. have a number of folks that need to answer. They do. Yeah, we're about 10 short from the last question. So yes, please get them in. There we go. Okay, keep hitting the poll. Uh, the only thing I would say in terms of the role of the government, I think one thing that we are starting to see in terms of incentives in the states, uh, it used to be about employment and getting employment into there. So governor's offices and economic development boards and states, that's what they really went after. Now they're going to fold in their ESG requirements too as well. How much water are you using? How much electricity? Uh, what kind of uh, positive impact that you have on the community? So you're starting to see some of those things in some of these incentive-driven uh, programs. And with that, I think it looks like everybody who wanted to answer this question, so we've got maybe one minute. Uh, I'll call on, um, how about Mark? What do you what do you think about the poll results at, at this point then in, in terms of response? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty much what I would expect, right? Board of directors, audit committee, CFO, seems like more of a, a, a top-down answer, right? That, you know, leadership drive these initiatives, make sure that it's cycling down to the individual departments. I think from a strategy standpoint, this is where you would expect those those shifts to, to come from. So it's kind of what I would expect. Okay. And so with that, I want to thank both Brett and Mark for today's webinar. I really appreciate it, gentlemen, for coming in and giving your perspective. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Eric. Thank you, Mike. And thank you, Mike, Mark, and Brett for an amazing panel discussion. And thank you everyone in the audience for joining us today for this fantastic webinar. Thanks again and enjoy the rest of your day.